the criticisms of these folks were more personal to Paul and his authority than, uh, than others were. And so uh, Paul doesn't even address what they might be teaching. He addresses the fact that they had no authority and standing to be undermining what he had done in the ministry at, uh, at Corinth. <clears throat> um, before Tim came on board as the president of SIBI, I served as the president for about 26 years. And uh, with Klein's advice, <clears throat> The day I started, I started a file in my personal filing cabinet called Critical Letters. <laughs> and over the 26 years, that file grew and grew and grew and grew. And, and at some point, when Tim became the president, I handed him a file about that thick, full of critical letters from people. Now, when I would receive a critical letter, and Tim, you need to listen to this. When, when I would receive a critical letter and folks demanding that I uh, ante up and, and, and explain uh, something I would uh, put that letter away for a little while and think about it and pray about it, it it's uh, it's probably not good to respond to criticism too quickly and too emotionally and it's probably better to uh, think and pray about it and then write something in response. And frankly, some of the um, some of the critical letters I just didn't respond to at all. But some of them required some kind of, of uh, response. And so um, I had another file and that file was nice letters. <laughs> and and it wasn't as thick as the critical file. <laughs> Isn't that strange? You know, in life, we will always find critics. People who who feel like maybe they need to advance their standing by dragging others down. And that's, that's kind of what Paul is experiencing here at, uh, at Corinth at this time. That's why he deals with these critics in, a, in an interesting way. Um, Paul sought the commendation of God in dealing with these critics in three ways. Here in chapter 10. First of all, he began to present God-approved spiritual warfare. And, and he's going to use some of those terms. Uh, He's going to go to battle with these, uh, with these critics, but he's going to do it not according to worldly standards, but according to spiritual standards. And, and he's seeking God's approval in doing this. And, and he's going to deal with God-approved spiritual authority. Who has real authority? And how, how do people develop real spiritual authority in life and in dealing with relationships and with others. And 
And then finally, he will, he will begin to describe a God-approved spiritual ministry. These critics of his said, oh, Paul's ministry is terrible. But our ministry is so much better. And so they began to tear down his ministry at Corinth to build up their, their own. And so uh, Paul is going to straighten out a lot of these things in, in these three uh, segments. First of all, he begins to deal with spiritual warfare. <laughs> he opens chapter 10 with this statement. Now I, Paul, myself, urge by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who am meek when face to face with you, but bold towards you when absent, we know immediately in chapter 10 that Paul's whole tone has changed because all through the book, he has been using we. We did this. We did that. We received this from God. We have this apostleship. He, he deals with the church and we. But the criticism of these critics is very personal. It's personal criticism against Paul. And so Paul responds personally. I, Paul, myself. This is how he's responding to his critics. And here's what he says. I who am meek when face to face with you, but bold towards you when absent. Little sarcasm here, because that was one of their criticisms of Paul. They would say, oh, yeah, he, he writes very boldly. He's brave from a distance, but he's a coward in person. That was their criticism of Paul. And so, little sarcastic uh, response here from Paul. He says, I ask that when I am present, I may not be bold with the confidence with which I propose to be courageous against some who regard us as if we walked according to the flesh. For we, for though we walk in flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war. He uses the word war. I mean, he is going to battle against the criticism that is undermining apostolic authority, undermining the whole Corinthian ministry that has been established for years and undermining the church at Corinth. He's going to war with these critics. But he says, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. He would say, look, I'm, I'm uh, in the flesh. I'm, I'm a physical person. But I'm not going to battle on that level. Not on the worldly level. I'm going to battle on a spiritual level. Level. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We're destroying speculation and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And we're ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. Paul uses so many references in his, in his uh, epistles to spiritual warfare. And he uses these terms in, in many, many of his writings. Uh, <clears throat> 
in this very book, in chapter 6 and verse 7, he says, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and the left. Well, it's kind of interesting that over in Ephesians chapter 6, he would, um, he would begin in verse 10 by saying, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Sounds just like what he's saying here in 2 Corinthians, doesn't it? It's on a spiritual level. But it's against the rulers and powers and world forces of darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Now then he describes the armor of God. And he says, put on the, the full armor of God. And Paul is picturing the Old Testament view that God is the God of hosts, the God of his army. He's leading his forces against all of the, all of the enemies of righteousness. And so Paul says, put on the full armor of God. He didn't say put on your armor. He said, put on God's armor. This is the armor of God that he battles with. And this is the armor that Christians need to battle with. Uh, righteousness and truth and the gospel and faith. All of those things are the armor of God. And, and Paul is saying that Christians need to arm themselves with God's armor. But then he describes two offensive weapons. Two weapons used to defeat the enemy. Not just protect yourself, but defeat these spiritual enemies. He says, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. The two weapons that are used to defeat all these spiritual forces are the Word of God and prayer. So it's no wonder that Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 6, with the weapons of righteousness in the left hand and the right hand, the right hand and the left hand, two weapons. Well, a lot, of, uh, a lot of words all through Paul's writing. Paul in, in Romans chapter 7 talks about the fact that there was, uh, he wanted to do right, he wanted to do good, but there was a law at work in me, he says, waging war against the law of my mind. And though I want to do this, I end up doing that. And I guess all of us have struggled with that at times. Maybe Paul is describing his life before he became a Christian, or maybe he's just describing what some of us go through on a daily basis, and that is wanting to do all, everything just right, and sometimes uh, we fail. But we have still the weapons of the Word of God in prayer, don't we? Um, and then he would say in Romans 13, lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light and fight the good fight of faith, Timothy. What's the battle? The battle surrounds the hearts and the minds and the souls of people. Fight the good fight of the faith. That's Timothy's battle and put on the full armor of God to stand against the devil. And remember, remember who the real enemy is, folks. The real enemy 
at Corinth wasn't those critics of Paul. I know he's going to he, he's going to take them to task, but he's taking them to task knowing what's behind their uh, coup in this ministry. It, it's satanic. The forces behind the people that may criticize us or do wrong, the force behind them is Satan himself and all the forces of darkness. So remember who the real enemy is, but also remember who the real source of power is to overcome these spiritual enemies. And that, of course, is God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit. So, how does Paul deal with this? He says, number one, that, that he urges you or appeals to you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I guess the first thing that, that we need to remember when we're faced with, with criticism is keep the right attitude. Uh, Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 5, it is the meek the gentle who will inherit the earth. And, and he would say in Matthew chapter 11, 28 and 29, come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden and you can find rest for I am meek and gentle. That's how he deals with us. Through meekness and gentleness. So keep the right attitude uh, when you deal with criticism. Paul said, I ask when I'm present, I may not be bold with confidence with which I propose to be courageous against some. Paul said, yeah, I, I could really be bold when I come and I hope I don't have to because I want to be gentle. I want to be meek. And I want to be positive. And Paul will of course say that um, this is not a worldly battle. Oh, these people are approaching it, the critics are approaching it from a worldly standpoint, but the battle will be won or lost on a spiritual level. So Paul is using spiritual weapons rather than worldly weapons to uh, to deal with this. And in verse 5, he is destroying the error, the worldly error that obscured the knowledge of God. <clears throat> That's what he's doing. And these people that were so horrible in their criticism of Paul we're doing it on a worldly level and their work of destroying the ministry of Paul and his authority would, that it was really destroying the very knowledge of God because when Paul established the church there he established the church based on his preaching of the gospel and of Christ and of the truth and they were undermining that by undermining the authority and ministry of the Apostle Paul. And then he talks about obedience. We're ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. Be obedient to Christ and expect obedience from others. Now Paul's going to deal with spiritual authority. They were really critical of his authority. They would say he's not really an apostle, but but we are the apostles. And they came with they came with letters of commendation, letters of recommendation from the, the people that really matter. 
And Paul would say, you're my letter. Remember 2 Corinthians chapter 3? You're my letter of recommendation. I mean, I started this thing with you folks. And I preached the gospel to you, and you're Christians because I came here. Uh, so you're my letter of recommendation. Well, how do you, how do you develop real spiritual authority? And, and, and how does Paul defend himself against the accusation that he had, he had no authority at all? Um, Jesus has got to be the primary example, right? When he finished the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, as he uh, did the finale to that Sermon on the Mount, the crowd said, as they were so amazed by his teaching, he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as the scribes and the Pharisees. He, he had authority. He had spiritual authority. Now, folks, the truth is you either have it or you don't. You can't buy it. You can't artificially produce it. Nobody can write a letter that says you have authority if you don't. And these critics really didn't have spiritual authority. They had worldly authority. And there's a huge, huge difference. Jesus described that difference many, many times, especially in Mark chapter 10 when the disciples were fussing about who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom, who was going to be preeminent, who was going to be first, who was going to sit at Jesus' right hand, who was going to sit at his left hand when he came into his kingdom. And, and you remember that Jesus said, oh, if you want to be great, then be a servant. But now if you want to be the greatest, be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for men. So Jesus put real spiritual authority, real leadership, on a different level than most people in his day would do. So, how do you have spiritual authority? Service. Serve others. Lower yourself to serve. And be obedient. Uh, Jesus encountered a centurion. You remember the centurion that he encountered that had a servant that was sick and he asked Jesus to heal him. Jesus said, I'll come to your house and heal him. And the centurion said, you don't need to come to my house. Just say the word. Because I am also a man under authority. He didn't say, I'm a guy in charge. He didn't say, I'm a man that has real authority. He said, I am a man under authority. What he was saying is, I know how to follow, I know how to obey, and I can see that you do too. So the centurion recognized that Jesus was under the authority of God and was obedient to God. And he said, I'm that way with my superiors. I know how to obey them, and because I know how to obey and be under authority, when I say to one of my soldiers, go, he goes. When I say to another one, come, he comes. Why? Because this man had authority that came from the highest level of the military. It, it wasn't his personally. It was that which was behind him. And he recognized that in Jesus also. So obedience is a part of having real spiritual authority, isn't it? And, and then there's that business of example. Paul said to, or rather Peter said to the elders who were 
his fellow elders. He said to those elders, shepherd the flock among you, not lording over those entrusted to you, but being an example. You, you have spiritual authority when you do what you say and what you teach. Example. And then there's that business of Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5 where Paul is talking about the unity of the church and, and how to deal with one another in the body of Christ. And, and I, just, um, I just heard from Bill Tracy that, that uh, in the fall when we have a new round of classes, our new study is going to be the one another passages in Scripture. How we deal with one another is, is very important to God. And, and Jesus uh, was a great example of that. So in dealing with unity and how to treat each other, Paul says in verse 5, in your relationships with one another, have the same attitude as Christ. Have the same attitude as Christ who, though he was in heaven, emptied himself and became a servant. In the form of a servant. Even submitting himself to the cross. Selfless humility. He didn't hang on to his position. Rather, he lowered himself and humbled himself in order to, uh, to serve others. So how did Paul identify spiritual authority here? Um, he will draw a distinction between the authority of these critics who claimed authority and the authority that he had from God. This, this is kind of an interesting statement. Paul used his authority to build up the church. His critics used the church to build up their authority. What a difference. He would say in 1 Corinthians 8, 1, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. These guys were puffed up, but they weren't building themselves up in the Lord's eyes, and they weren't building others up. They were just tearing Paul down in order to look like they were being elevated. So, Paul would say in chapter in <coughs> 7, you're looking at things as if they are outwardly. If anyone is confident in himself that he is Christ, let him consider this again within himself, that just as he is Christ, so also are we. So in the first part of that, he's going to say to them, be careful to judge people and circumstances fairly not just by appearance. He says, you're looking at things from a worldly standpoint. You're just, you're just looking, you're judging me from appearances. Oh, they claim that he was not good looking and he didn't talk real good. And, and his bodily presence was weak. He said, you're judging by appearances, not by the real values. And we need to be careful that we don't judge people and circumstances just from the way things look on the outside. There's another dimension. But then in, in the next uh, uh, part of that very verse, it says, if anyone is confident in himself that he is Christ, let him consider this again within himself, that just as he is Christ, so also are we. They were not very magnanimous and generous with their view of Paul, were they? 
maybe maybe they needed to give Paul the benefit of the doubt, which they didn't do. And it's always it's always interesting that sometimes we look at something and then jump to a conclusion that may not be the right conclusion regarding the person. So give others the benefit of the doubt regarding their relationship to Christ. Verse 8. He says, For even if I should boast somewhat further about our authority which the Lord gave for building you up, not for destroying you, I shall not be put to shame. And so Paul's going to say again, use authority to build others up, not to tear others down. Our authority is not to just talk about how bad everybody is and to be negative about everybody, but our authority is advanced when we try to encourage and build people up in the faith. And maybe in your authority, don't try to put people on a guilt trip constantly and, and, uh, and cause them to be constantly in fear of you or what you're going to do or say. Paul says in verse 9, For I do not wish to seem as if I would terrify you with my letters. For they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his personal appearance is, impress it is unimpressive in his speech, is contemptible. Paul wasn't just trying to scare people. He was trying to help people get right with God. And in verses 10 and 11, for well, they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his personal appearance is unimpressive, his speech is contemptible. Let such a person consider this, that what we are in word and by letter, when absent, such persons we are indeed when present. I think what Paul is saying here is, I'm consistent. What I tell you in my letters, I'm going to tell you and be when I'm in person. And, and if you want to have spiritual authority, then be genuine, be consistent in personal relationships and in communication. Be the same here and there. Be the same person, live by the same values, and you'll have spiritual authority. But then there's the business of spiritual ministry. How do we really measure our ministry? How do we figure out if our ministry is doing any good, if it's accomplishing anything? Uh, you know, a lot of times, we measure ministry just by stats, numbers. How many are here? How much money is there? How much has been accomplished? And we, we, we look at the stats. And that's certainly one way to evaluate results. But Paul is going to talk about how to really measure spiritual ministry and and in doing so what he's going to say is the ministry of these critics doesn't measure up and the criticisms that they have of of the ministry at Corinth that he established that ministry is not that uh, evaluation is not valid because they are measuring the wrong things. So how do you measure spiritual ministry? Um, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul describes... <clears throat> 
spiritual ministry and what it's all about and, and the people that are involved in that. In verse 11, he says, He gave some as apostles, prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, and to a mature man, to the measure of the stature that belongs to the fullness of Christ. How do you really measure a ministry? He says you measure it by how well you have equipped people to grow into the very image of Wow, what a challenge that is. And how do you measure that? Well, that's our challenge. And that was uh, the challenge all through uh, Paul's life and ministry and Peter and all the other apostles. The challenge was, what is our ministry really all about? What are we trying to accomplish here? Uh, Paul and uh, Barnabas were a part of a a prayer group at Antioch and they were these prophets were praying and fasting before the Lord and the Holy Spirit said set apart Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them and the church got together sent them out on the first missionary journey to the, to the area of Galatia and then sometime later we don't know exactly how long might have been a year, two years, three years, we don't know. Sometime later, they came back to Antioch and uh, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work which they had now accomplished. Wow. That's how the Holy Spirit measures ministry. What did they accomplish? Well, according to Ephesians, they had to accomplish equipping God's people for works of service and helping them to grow in the very image of Christ. And then they could come back and say, we finished. Now, they would go back time and time again to, uh, to, to help those people on the journey. But establishing that watermark for ministry is very, very important. And so Peter would say, all of you use whatever gift you've received to serve others. Serving others, using what God has given us, helping people to grow into the image of Christ. That the apostles were given that commission Go make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But that next verse, verse 20, is important. And teaching them, those that are baptized, to obey everything that I have given to you. And so he would say, my Father is glorified in this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to me to be my disciples. Now, how do we measure spiritual ministry? How did Paul measure it? And how did he deal with his critics that had the wrong standard of, of spiritual, uh, of uh, me ministry measurement? So in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, by the way, in order to, to really evaluate our ministry we have to ask the right questions because if we answer if we ask and answer the wrong questions we really don't evaluate our ministry properly and, and uh, Paul's critics were asking all the wrong questions and making all the wrong accusations based on those, uh, those faulty understandings so I, I got this little quote from uh, Lauren who wrote a commentary on 2 
Christ's disciples have accomplished more by love than by hate, more by faith than by flesh, more by prayer than propaganda. Maybe that's a good beginning as Paul talked about. The yardstick used to measure ministry and spiritual ministry. In verse 11, verse 12, he says, For we're not bold to class or compare ourselves with some of those who commend themselves, but when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they're without understanding. They were using the, the wrong yardstick. They were using their own preconceived notions about what's real ministry and what's not real ministry, and they came up with all the wrong conclusions. So the question mark is, am I using the right yardstick? Am I using God's ministry yardstick to evaluate my ministry, or am I using my own biased opinion, maybe based on all the wrong criteria? Verse 13, but we will not boast beyond our measure, but within the measure of the sphere which God apportioned to us as a measure to reach even as far as you. Paul was saying, it was God that gave me this. He gave me this ministry. He gave me this opportunity. And, and, and I came to Corinth because of the opportunity that God gave me and the gifts he gave me. Now, the question for us is, as we try to evaluate our ministry, am I using God's gifts and opportunities as he wants me to? And am I where he wants me to be? That's a question that that our students constantly ask as, as they get toward the senior year and the last, uh, the last term and the last semester of their studies here. Where am I going to go? What am I going to do? Who's going who's gonna to partner with me in this ministry? They're constantly struggling with that question. And the the answer is they have to use the gifts and opportunities that God gives them to be where He wants them to be. And if they're using the right gifts and the right opportunities, they're going to end up where God wants them. But that's a struggle that many of us have. Verse 14 for well, we're not overextending ourselves as if we did not reach to you. For we were the first to come even as far as you in the gospel of Christ. The critics were saying, oh, now Paul doesn't care anything about you anymore. He told you he was going to come and he didn't come when he said he was going to come. And so he really doesn't care anything about you anymore. And Paul is going to say, no, I'm, I'm going to help you finish. So how do you evaluate your ministry? Am I staying focused to finish well the ministry God has given me? Paul was in there battling spiritually for these Corinthians. And he was going to stay there and he was going to come to them again and again. He'll come to them. He'll write at least four letters to them. He'll come to them at least three or four times and visit them and try to straighten out problems. He is committed to finish what he started. Sometimes we are just kind of flash in the pan, uh, a spurt here and a spurt there. Uh, yeah, we'll do this, and then we'll go over here and we'll do something else. No. Maybe we need to stay and finish what we started. That's a, that's a principle that Paul observed. Am I developing and growing my ministry instead of just taking credit for others' ministry? 
and verse 14 and 15 are we're not boasting beyond our measure that is in other labor others laborers but with the hope that as your faith grows we shall be within our sphere enlarged even more by you so as to preach the gospel even to the regions beyond you and not to boast in what has been accomplished in the sphere of another am i developing and growing my ministry instead of just taking credit for others paul had grown the ministry and developed the ministry in corinth these guys were interlopers they came in later and began to tear down the ministry of Paul and we've seen that in mission fields all over the world that people that didn't fight the, the battles <laughs> the spiritual battles that it took to establish a beachhead would come in later and try to tear down the ministry instead of, of going and developing a ministry uh, someplace else. So Paul, Paul is saying, as he would say to the Roman church, uh, I'm going to come by you, Romans 15, and I'm going to ask you to send me to Spain where the church had not yet been planted. He was always looking to the regions beyond, but he wanted the people that were a part of his ministry to be involved in that ministry of reaching and extending the ministry even to others. And the bottom line is, am I always giving glory to God for everything accomplished in my ministry instead of taking credit for myself? But he who boasts, let him boast in the Lord. So comparing all of these things we we got one more one more thing. Have we got time for this? What time? We're all right. Okay. Here's some lessons to take home, and and uh, maybe you maybe you've got some ideas you want to share at this at this point too. It it seems to me that that we're learning in chapter ten that Christianity is very practical. It helps us to deal with our greatest challenges. And one of the greatest challenges we have to deal with as Christians is human relationships. Relationships in our home, relationships in our workplace, relationships in our community, in our world, and relationships in the church. The Bible deals with those practical things constantly. How we treat others is so important to God. And, and that's what Paul is saying to the church at Carbon. How these, how these critics were treating Paul and how they were treating the church there was not right. Have, have you experienced any of those challenges? getting along with others, dealing with human relationships and family and church. I, you could just stand and give some testimonials now if you'd like to tell you about, about that. But, but time prevents that. <laughs> Growing a Christ-like attitude, second lesson to take home. Growing a Christ-like attitude can help us to deal with criticism for others and avoid being hypercritical of others. That doesn't need much commentary, does it? And finally, if we always give all the glory to God for everything we do and accomplish, we won't have to worry much about who gets the credit. So that's chapter 10. Hope that uh, you've gotten something that you can take home from that, something that will be a part of your life. God bless. We'll just leave that up.
lesson. And your other two or three minutes, you two worked out about right because it took almost that long to get on this list. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we have several on our prayer list today, so uh, I will go through those. Linda Ashley is uh, having uh, hip surgery. You remember Floyd Boyer. Belinda Harden uh, lost her sister. And Ben Walton and new family have moved to Nebraska. Remember all the elders, preachers, teachers, missions, and the new elders. And praise God for all things. Mildred Eckstein, uh, Viola's sister, is in covenant. Betty Waddell's not doing well. The boss is in Egypt, Charleston's in Scotland. And uh, Bruce and Vicki Arps and the death of their daughter, Jamie. Uh, there's another note on Foy Barrier, no more chemo, and he's praying for the body to gain strength. Tanya Combest, Eric Holmes, who's Judy Holmes' son, uh, had a liver transplant last fall. You remember Kevin Haynes' is grief as he's leaving for Israel this week. Brenda Hall is having a third eye surgery on the same eye. And some of you may know Andy Anderson, that's in Broadway, and he passed away last night from brain cancer. He uh, lasted about a year and a half time they discovered it so and uh, then uh, on a good note uh, Clayton is having an 80th birthday on the 23rd so we need to congratulate him okay well let's go to our father in prayer gracious heavenly father we approach your throne and asking your help and comfort and, and strengthen uh, the individuals that have been mentioned and we know that uh, a lot of people are uh, in pain and, and having bad health and we just ask your uh, blessings on them and help them to uh, endure what they are going through and we most of all uh, appreciate the efforts that uh, that you you do for us, and uh, as you always uh, provide for us in every way, and we're just so thankful for that. Just continue to go with us uh, through this day and this week, and just help us to always give you the all the glory and for everything that uh, that we have. It's in his name we ask. Amen. Amen.